and and then Uh, well, hello. We have um, 12 o'clock on, on our clock. Um, so um, I'm Kayla Sue. Welcome back to our Kinetic Health Wellbeing webinar. Um, today's topic is oral health. Um, and so I have Dr. Pierce here. We'll talk more about oral health and how it relates to your overall health um, of your body. And so before I hand it off, I'm going to um, review some of our housekeeping items. Um, so all attendees are in listen only mode, so you don't have to worry about coming off of mute accidentally. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, please, please uh, submit those in the chat box. It's located um, at the right hand side of your webinar screen. Um, so feel free to chat with us, uh, may answer questions throughout and definitely at the end um, of the presentation. And you can access today's presentation slides and resources by clicking on the handout section. And again, that's on the right hand side of your webinar screen. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Matt Pierce. All right, thank you, Ms. Kayla. Thanks. Um, so just a little bit of a background about me. Um, I did grow up on the east side of Indianapolis for those people that are local around New Palestine area. I went to IUPUI for my undergrad with a Purdue degree in biology. And then I graduated from the IU School of Dentistry in 2013 uh, with my doctor of dental surgery. So I'm one of those rare breeds that I have a Purdue and an IU degree. So whoever's winning in the state, I'm feeling pretty happy about when it comes to college ball. Um, I do currently own three dental offices, uh, White River Family Dental, located in Greenwood, Indiana, Jackson County Dental, which is located in Seymour, Indiana, and then Monroe County Family Dental, which is located in Bloomington, Indiana. So just a little bit of a heads up, a little bit of background about me. If you guys do have any questions throughout, I will try to get to any questions that you have, and then we'll just kind of dive into it. Like Kayla said, what I'm here to do today is just talk to you about the importance of oral health, its connection with the body systemically, things that we can and do to improve oral health, what we should be doing in the office to improve things, what we can be doing at home, and then just some little quick FAQs. Um, so that way, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, feel free to ask. We'll just kind of dive into it. So the big thing here is why is oral health important? A lot of people, whenever they take a look at the mouth and oral health, they see it as a separation from the rest of the body. They don't necessarily get the connection. There's just a general lack of knowledge about the correlation between systemic and oral health. And I can say that because between having three dental offices, between having a staff of over 45, these people work day in and day out in the mouth. Even for them, sometimes it's not at the forefront of their mind. So with that, with the 12,000 patients that I have between my three offices, between the patients that I see at some of the volunteer days that I do, patients and people in general just don't always get the connection. They don't always understand the importance of oral health, and they're able to go in and just separate the two of them mentally. Um, despite that, oral health is one of the most uncommon unmet needs in healthcare. People are usually pretty good if they feel something going wrong with their body going into the hospital, going to the ER, going to their PCP, things like that to get things addressed or taken care of, going into the local CVS Minute Clinic. Unfortunately, with oral health care, there's more of a disparity there that's present. The majority of oral diseases and needs honestly could be prevented and or maintained with routine care, whether that be at home, whether that be at the dental office. So we're just going to kind of go over some of this stuff, see what we can shed light on, see what we can improve on there. So why, why is oral health important? Um, oral manifestations of systemic conditions and diseases occur every day. Sorry for the people that are grossed out for the pictures that you see there. Um, you'll see one picture of somebody that has a, um, a little pernicious anemia. You'll see somebody that has some ulcerations, things like that. But oral manifestations of systemic diseases and conditions can actually <clears throat> be pretty prominent. So you'll see I've got listed heart disease, diabetes, pregnancy. Yes, even pregnancy. I've had patients that come in and they their gums are bleeding. They can't figure out what's going on. It's changed since their last dental appointment. We send them over to their PCP. They get a pregnancy test and oh, turns out they didn't realize they were pregnant. Nutritional deficiencies, infectious diseases, bloodborne diseases, HIV, various STDs, GI disorder, respiratory disease, there are tons of things that can manifest in the mouth. So 
making sure that we're up to date on proper oral health care, getting those routine examinations can kind of help us guide down that path a little bit better. Nearly every body system has a disease or disorder that can have oral manifestations. A lot of people, again, don't think that something unrelated to the head and neck area can have an oral manifestation, uh, but it happens more often than you think. For that reason, routine oral health care and examinations can help identify and prevent progression of such diseases. The number of times in a week that I see somebody that has an oral manifestation of a systemic disease seems to go up every single week and seems to shock the person that I was able to find something they have going on systemically um, through the oral cavity. So oral health or lack thereof can also have manifestations systemically as well. It's a two-way street. It doesn't necessarily have to go one way or the other. If you have some things going on in your mouth, it can also uh, show up throughout the rest of the body as well. As I kind of um, mentioned above, oral health can have implications outside of that. It can also have numerous mental and emotional health components. A lot of people, we'd like to take our, our physical health and put it in a box and separate it from our mental and emotional health, but the two tie together um, a lot. Oral health is the exact same way. If you think about it, being a child, having the confidence to smile at school, being an adult going for a job interview, discomfort leading to lack of an ability to function and eat normally, all can play a role in somebody's mental and emotional health. Impaired speech, things like this. These are all things that we need to think about and we need to start putting into our oral health box and just know that it kind of branches out as opposed to having our blinders on. Outside of that, oral health can have a big issue um, and impact uh, socioeconomically. Lack of employment opportunities. If somebody comes into someone's office uh, for a job interview and it looks like they're not very well kept, they have a lot of things going on in their mouth, they're missing teeth, they're, they have impaired speech, they're not able to talk properly, things like that, that can impact their ability to have a job at some point. It can also uh, cause an impact for as far as missing work. Management, uh, managing appointments due to poor maintenance and care can also also play a role. If you hire somebody in, you want to make sure that they're doing everything that they can mentally, emotionally, physically, and in their mouth to make sure that they're able to show up to, to work, right? When we hire people, when we have people that are coming in, we want them to come in and do their job. A lack of good oral health care can impact their ability to show up at work and have the attendance that we kind of are looking for. It's also causing a healthcare system overload at ER. I have so many friends that are physicians, whether it's ER physicians um, and whatnot, that talk about how they have to see patients due to toothaches, due to abscesses, due to things that if they would have just seen their dentist, if they would have went into the dental office, that they would have been able to kind of prevent having to get to the point where it reaches an abscess or an infection that ends up landing them in the ER. So again, that healthcare system overload is something else that's impacted um, by a lack of proper oral health care. Uh, lastly, children missing school due to untreated oral disease. You, you'd be surprised the number of kids that I see day in and day out that come in with abscesses, teeth that are broken off at the gum line, cavities throughout their entire mouth because they just don't get the proper health care they need. With that, yeah, it is sad. It's, 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 unfortunate to think of children having to go through that, but it's something that we could easily prevent if we were just a little bit more cognizant and aware of the connection of how oral health care can affect so many different aspects of one's life. So kind of like I alluded to or earlier, there is an oral health link. So this is the connection between the mouth and the rest of the body. I did talk about the manifestations of other systemic diseases that can present in the oral cavity. With that, the most common oral health concerns that we see in the dental office are obviously cavities, gum and bone diseases, and dental abscesses. These are the things that whenever you think of going to, going to the dentist, that's what we're looking for, that's what we're treating, we're doing that, but we're also looking for those manifestations I mentioned earlier, and we're doing oral cancer screenings. Those are the most common things that we see. We do see some other things where we have, you know, traumatic issues where somebody comes in, they had a workman's comp case, got hit in the face, slipped on some ice, something like that. We do have that, but it's not one of the more common oral health concerns that we see day in and day out. 
Conversely, the oral health issues can manifest systemically. Cavities, gum, and bone diseases, dental abscesses all result from bacteria negatively impacting the oral cavity and leading to an immune response. When I say this to people, they instantly think, oh, well, let's just fix it with antibiotics. Just like everything else in the medical world, there is no magic antibiotic pill that fixes everything 100% of the time. Antibiotics alone do not treat the bacteria that I'm talking about that are present in the oral cavity. Routine home care and dental examinations are needed in conjunction with that as well in order to help manage those situations. When we have this bacteria overload that's kind of going on in the mouth, right, we generate an immune mediated response. So when oral health is out of norm, and by out of norm, I mean it's not in a healthy state, we have cavities, we have gum and bone disease, we have a lot of these dental abscesses that are going on, an immune response happens. Elevated C-reactive proteins and other immune factors, I won't get into all that stuff, but it happens on a systemic level. Our body tries to localize res this response just to the mouth or just to the affected area as best as it can, but it's unable to do so. It, the way that I like to think about it is, imagine you're sick. You have lung congestion, flu, cold, something like that. Even though that generally is affecting one specific area, you have some lung congestion, you have a little bit of a cough. Your entire body can often feel off, achy, sore, uncomfortable, makes you tired. And that's because your body isn't able to localize that immune response perfectly, just one specific area. Conversely, on the flip side of that, our body can't always contain the spread of bacteria just to one area. So when we do have this rampant bacteria that's out of control in our gums, in our bone, in dental abscesses, our body's not able to localize that just to one area. And that's because throughout our mouth, throughout our entire body, we have blood and lymph tissue that's running through it. Yes, that includes your teeth. Have that going through it as well. With that being said, because there is such a close connection between the mouth and the rest of the body, because this bacteria can flow back and forth and things like that, there are even surgical treatments such as joint replacements, heart surgeries, cancer treatment, things like that, that require dental clearance prior to the patient receiving the above treatment. Now, granted, if it's a true emergency situation, truly life or death, yes, and if you're at the ER, they, they're not going to call asking for dental clearance prior to, you know, fixing some major trauma case that just kind of rolled in off the ambulance. But if it's something that is pre-planned, they will deny and they will make sure that they don't necessarily put a patient in a more harmful situation by doing a surgery before they have dental clearance. This is just another indication of why it's so important that we get things under control, that we do things in our mouth that's going to positively impact the rest of our body. So with that, what I want to talk a little bit about is ideal oral health care. So we've touched on the importance of oral health care. We know its connection with the body, with in its entirety and all the systems. We know that it plays a role back and forth there, but what do we do to try and maintain this? So I'm gonna talk about in-office care a little bit, then I'm gonna talk about what patients and people can do at home to kind of maintain, um, and what we can just kind of do to try and set this trend moving forward to be a little bit more proactive on things as opposed to in a reactive state. So for in-office care, dental exam and cleaning twice per year at minimum, this has become a standard in the dental world that you need an exam and a cleaning twice per year. My insurance covers a cleaning and exam twice per year, so that's all that I need. The whole thought of twice per year, it just started as an ad campaign for a toothpaste company called Pepsodent. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen there. Uh, in 1929, just to sell more toothpaste. It got so popular that we have adopted that as a fully systemic way of thinking about dental exams and going to see the dentist. In all actuality, each individual should be assessed based on their needs for frequencies of exams and cleanings. That being said, there are some people that benefit from cleanings three to four times per year. Not everybody should be on it twice per year at minimum. A lot of people do like to look at an insurance reimbursement rate and think that that's the norm that they need to be on, but it's not like that for every single person, okay? It does require roughly 90 days for bacteria to establish a colony in the oral cavity, disrupting it with an exam, with cleaning, going in and just disrupting that bacteria, allowing it 
or not allowing it to kind of set into the mouth is one way that we can kind of reduce that bacteria load in the mouth, reduce that bacteria load systemically. So there are plenty of people that fall into that three to four times a year category that they need to be seen to help call back some of those numbers and get it to a more healthy state. On top of that, we do obviously recommend routine radiographs. A full set of radiographs is usually 15 to 20 radiographs. Um, we do that every five to 10 years. Bite wing radiographs, which is the ones that most people are used to getting, we typically do that once a year. It's usually two or three pictures on the right, two or three pictures on the left. These are the ones that you think of as looking for cavities, looking at those bone levels, checking to see that everything's doing okay on a routine basis. The last one that we do is a panoramic or it's a whole upper and lower jaw radiograph. We do that alternating with the full set of radiographs every five to 10 years. What this one looks for is it looks for abnormalities in the upper and lower jaw bone, takes a look at your TMJ, which is the joint that you use for opening and closing, takes a look at your sinuses. Yes, we can even see your sinuses. We can identify cysts that are going on in your sinuses. We can identify other problems and issues that are going on from some of these radiographs, just as a heads up there. In relation to that, periodontal probing is something that a lot of people go through. Usually once a year, we go in and we take measurements um, around the gums of the teeth. What this is, is it's an annual screening for gum and bone disease. These measurements are crucial at identifying areas of concern before they turn into a large problem. These are the measurements for the people that know where you go through and you get ones and twos and threes called out. What we're doing is we're trying to identify the health of the gums and bone, but also to identify what kind of cleaning. A lot of people think that everybody gets the same type of cleaning, but really it depends on what kind of condition the gum and bone are in. If they have gingivitis, periodontitis, things like this, that would not necessarily be the same cleaning as somebody who has perfectly healthy gums, who comes four times a year and things like that. So we do go through and try and do a periodontal probing, screening, and evaluation on every patient at least once a year. One other thing that we do is fluoride applications. My personal opinion is if you've had a cavity in the past two years, you could benefit from a fluoride application at every recare visit. Typically, your normal toothpaste that you would get that's Crest or Colgate or Arm & Hammer usually has rough, roughly 1,100 parts per, per million of fluoride in it. The fluoride varnish application that we do in the office is roughly 22,000 parts per million. So if you think about it as 20 times stronger, its ability to go in, help remineralize, harden the tooth, and prevent some of these areas of cavities and decay from progressing, um, it's, it's, it's a big benefit. I tell people that as far as one thing that they can do in the office that they may have to pay for sometimes it's the biggest benefit it would be a fluoride varnish application just because it helps reduce some of those decay rates. If you have extensive dental work to maintain, get a fluoride application every recare visit. One cavity getting fixed, one filling replaced, one crown being replaced, one bridge that gets undermined and replaced. If you go through that once, you'll wish you would have just had the fluoride application. So just as a heads up on that. There are a few things in the dental world that are really on the up and up. Uh, for instance, we do have oral cancer screening lights. One example, it's called a Velscope. What it does is it detects abnormality in the tissues. So with that, you would come in and it's a literal light that we use. We And it identifies any areas that have increased blood flow or abnormal tissue structure, and then we send that out for evaluation. It's one way we in the dental world are working to be more proactive and less reactive on some of these things. Um, we do 3D imaging at, at a lot of offices, at some of my offices, similar to a CT scan at a hospital. What it does is it goes around your head and it actually 3D renders your entire, um, entire upper and lower jaw, sinuses, sometimes the joint and the rest of the skull. So that way we can actually go in segmentally and look at everything as opposed to just a standard x-ray. We have 3D impression scanning now. If you've ever had an impression and you have to bite down on the goopy stuff, let it set up for a few minutes, we actually can do a lot of that stuff digitally now. We're able just to scan with what looks like a little handheld camera. We're now starting to do some laser bacteria laser therapy for bacteria, apologize on that, cavity removal, things like that. 
as opposed to just the normal drills and the normal instruments, we do have laser therapy that's that's starting in the dental dental world. Uh, if you have sensitive teeth, we do have desensitizing gels and things like that, very similar to whitening gel that they are now uh, using to treat people that just have sensitive teeth. I have patients all the time that come in and say, oh, I've never been able to eat ice cream for the past 20 years. To me, that's that's a problem. You should be able to enjoy some of those things in life. Yes, I eat ice cream. I love ice cream. I love candy, all that stuff. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But if you're having discomfort that's preventing you from being able to enjoy some of those things, we're working in the dental field to try and improve the quality of life for people by doing some of this stuff. Uh, we're getting in the process of remineralizing cavities. There are some cases where drilling out the cavity isn't the best scenario. With that, we do have some cases where we're able to go in, actually work to remineralize it, stabilize the tooth. Um, if we're not able to go in, uh, in and remove the cavity and place the filling. We also are getting very, I would say very high tech with some of the surgical things. A lot of times people think of surgeries, they only think of removing teeth or getting an implant placed to replace a tooth, but we're actually getting to the point where in my office and in many other offices, we do things like um, bone grafting and sinus lift surgeries and things like that. But even past that, we're, we are getting to the point where we're actually working to transplant teeth while they're forming from one site to another. So if somebody is congenitally missing a tooth, we're getting to the point where we can actually take a tooth, transplant it from one area of their mouth, put it in another area of the mouth. We can actually regrow some teeth and things like that. So there's a lot of cutting edge stuff that I imagine in the next five to 10 years is really gonna change the dynamic and game of how we treat a lot of things in the dental office. As far as home care for ideal oral, oral health, Yes, brush in the morning after breakfast, coffee, things like that. So whenever you, you're done and you're at the point where you're not consuming those carbs anymore, anything with sugar, stuff like that, when you're done eating your breakfast, brush after that. Nightly brushing prior to going to sleep. Yes, ideally it would be two minutes of brushing. Um, I think you'd be surprised if you set a timer or you get an electric toothbrush, how long two minutes feels. I know there are some other things in life. Two minutes feels like a really short period of time. Brushing ain't one of them. Two minutes feels like a very long time when you're when you're doing it. So I, I would recommend you try and set a timer for that. If I had to pick, yes, nighttime is the more important of the two. Um, I still obviously would recommend both. I tell patients and people only brush the teeth you want to keep. If you don't want to keep them, don't worry about brushing them. Um, and try and use a fluoridated toothpaste. There are some other different options as far as toothpaste. So if you have any questions, feel free to. Uh, shoot me an email if you have specifics on certain toothpaste and things like that. Daily flossing, uh, obviously we recommend almost everybody hears that conversation whenever they go in and talk to their hygienist. We do recommend daily flossing. Water picks can help in some situations, but a water pick isn't floss, just like a floss isn't water pick. So there are some people and some combinations that we do recommend both of them. And I do recommend having a conversation with your um, your dentist um, or the dental team and staff. And then obviously a routine oral cancer self-exam. Just like you are encouraged to do you know, other self-exams, take a look for a mold that looks suspicious. If you feel any lumps, bumps, things that don't go away, same thing goes with your mouth. If you do find any abnormalities, whenever you're brushing, flossing, just taking a look, take a photo of it, make notes. Don't feel like you have to wait until your next recare appointment to go into the dental office and get it checked out. Again, we wanna be proactive. We wanna get people coming in. We wanna get the people to come in and do what needs to be done uh, before it becomes a big issue, okay? So take those photos, make notes um, and things like that and talk to, you, talk to your dental care team. So I've gone in and I've talked about the importance of oral health care, the connection between the oral cavity and the body systemically, talked about some things that you can do at home, talked about some things that you can do in office. Outside of that, I've had a lot of people ask me questions that are, um, that will kind of go over, just random dental advice, random thoughts, things that I can express to help make your dental journey easier for yourself, for a friend, for a colleague, for um, a client of yours. Um, so just as a heads up on that. So one I get a lot is people are scared to go into the dentist. My recommendation is express this early on. To 
to the dental office you're looking for. We do have options where we can sedate people. Ask family and friends their thoughts on their dentist. Try and find somebody that you think is going to work with your fear, with your phobia, things like that. We do have plenty of patients that come in, they get sedated, they get the dental work done, and it gets taken care of. We as a dental profession have set ourselves to a point where a lot of people are scared to go to the dentist, and it's because of things that happened 25 plus years ago. But this day and age, almost every dental office is very conscientious of this. So if it's expressed early on, they can get a patient on the right track. Uh, electric toothbrush, is it worth the investment? My personal opinion, absolutely. Um, if you think about it, when you go to the dental office and your hygienist is cleaning your teeth, they don't just brush it with a toothbrush, right? They have a power, um, an air-driven um, little power brush that they use. So it does do a better job than you're manually going to do. When it rotates and oscillates, it's going to do it at a frequency that's quicker than you're ever going to do brushing. Also on top of that, some of the new uh, electric toothbrushes have timers on them. They have pressure gauge indicators, so you don't put too much pressure. You don't put not enough pressure. Um, and for some people, it just makes it more fun, right? Especially if you have kids and things like that, it's tough to get them to brush for more than five seconds. Sometimes an electric toothbrush is worth the investment. Uh, when you tell us you brush and floss regularly, can we tell if you are full of it? Uh, yeah, no need to lie on that. Just be honest. Uh, it helps us figure out the best way to help you. Yes, if you say that you floss every day and you brush every day, unless you have something systemically that's going wrong, we can usually tell if you're lying to us, even if you did it right before you came in there. So don't waste your effort and lie. We, we honestly don't care. Should you pay extra for non-insurance covered things? My opinion, yeah, if you need it. If you think about dental insurance, it's a business, right? Just like any kind of insurance. Um, as, a, as a patient, right, the dental insurance is there to help out. It is not there to dictate need for any kind of treatment. Dental insurance companies are designed to make money for themselves as a business. They're trying to protect their shareholders. They're trying to protect their company. Their end goal isn't necessarily putting a patient's needs first. So if you truly need something or you think you would benefit from a non-covered service, you should absolutely get it done, right? Needs versus wants, think short-term versus long-term, things like that. That $20 for fluoride or $35 or whatever it is, if it saves you from having to get one cavity, it's worth it, right? So I tell patients to think about needs versus wants, um, short and long-term on that. Should someone get a second opinion? If you feel uncomfortable, absolutely get a third opinion if need be. There is a caveat there. Um, if you tell it, if you, and I'll be honest, if you tell a dentist you want a second opinion because you've recommended, you've been recommended 13 fillings, the odds are the new dentist is going to find less than 13 fillings. They might find 11 fillings and watch two of them. The reason that I say that is if you don't have trust in the provider to the point where you think you need a second opinion, why are you going to see them anyways? Ask the advice of the people working with the dentist as well, right? We are, we are a full team, things like that. You can get great ideas, thoughts, and opinions from the staff as well as from the dentist. But in, in my opinion, if you don't trust somebody to the point where you think you need to go get a second second opinion, second advice, you should probably go somewhere else where you feel comfortable with the treatment that they have recommended for you. Teeth whitening options. Um, in office is probably the most effective. And so a lot of people think of like Zoom whitening or when you go to the mall and things like that. It is the most effective, but it can be the most expensive. Uh, at home is also a great option. It's a slower onset. It's a little easier to maintain. My opinion is if you wanted really white teeth, I would do both. I do think that some of the whitening strips, when you put it on, you have to think of how far back is it whitening my teeth and things like that. Uh, Invisalign and braces, uh, a lot of people ask about that. It's not just about straight teeth, but it is about a balanced bite in cleansable areas. Yes, having a nice, beautiful, straight smile is great. It's amazing. I do a ton of Invisalign cases. I send a lot of people to go get traditional braces. And they think it's just about having a nice straight smile, nice straight teeth. That just happens to be a secondary benefit. The main reason we do this is because 
if the teeth are in an improper bite pattern, it will affect them long term. Again, we're trying to be proactive and say, we see this issue now, let's fix it so that way 30 years from now, 10 years from now, you're not dealing with a problem we should have fixed. Mail order items such as Smile Direct, braces and et cetera, I, I don't recommend doing it. I, I fix a lot of these cases. Snap-on smiles and veneers, honestly, it's just you're putting a Band-Aid on something. A lot of people look at it as a permanent solution. It's not. So my honest recommendation is avoid it. You're going to end up spending more money in the end as opposed to just doing it right the first time. I'm a fan of just doing something right the first time. I've had a lot of patients say my parent had my parent or parents have dentures, so I know I will. Um, yeah, I, I think that if you have the same bad habits as your parents, then yeah, sure, you probably will. But if you don't have the same bad habits of your parents, irregardless of genetics, genetics can play a role with this, but more so it's just environmentally, are you doing the same things your parents did? If so, then yeah, there's a good chance. If they didn't go to the dentist and you don't, then there is a good chance of that. Some people like to use this as, as an excuse, in my opinion, not to necessarily do what needs to be done or what should be done, just as a way so they can say, hey, end goal is going to be here anyways. Uh, I have a lot of pregnant people that have said, my baby took the calcium out of my teeth uh, while your hormones can fluctuate, yes, and cause puffy gums, bleeding, and things like that. Usually blaming the baby and the pregnancy for this statement isn't true. It's usually a lack of good habits or an incorporation of other bad habits that cause that cavity or cause this problem. Once your teeth are fully formed, as far as sucking the calcium out of it, it doesn't really work like that. So this is just one of those things that a lot of people say, a lot of people think, but usually it's just maybe take an internal reflection moment and see if there was another cause for it. Should I go to an in-network dentist? Again, I kind of second what I said above, only if you trust the dentist. I think choosing your dentist based on networking alone is like picking out a hairstylist based on the coupons you find in the paper. If, if you prefer the best care for your needs or the cheapest care. Again, needs versus want. Is the cheapest option available what works for you or, is, or are you honestly looking for the best option available for you? The two can coincide, absolutely, but I don't like to use one to necessarily dictate what I'm going to do for myself. Uh, and lastly, should I replace missing teeth? Yeah, absolutely. Unbalanced bites will only make other teeth fail in time, right? You're driving around on your car and you blow one tire. Are you just going to keep that spare on there or drive around without a tire on there? No, improper balance and things like that. So if you are missing teeth, things like that, I always recommend people try and replace those, not just again from an aesthetic point of view, but more so from getting everything loaded and balanced in a proper bite pattern. So if you guys have any questions, I know I rambled on a little bit, uh, let's connect. Yeah, my information is down here. Feel free to send me an email. Um, Kayla and the rest of the group have some information on my offices. If anybody does have any specific dental related questions, things like that, I would be more than happy to, I would be more than happy to answer them. I, like many people, as you can see here, I had a fear of the dentist when I was younger. I got kicked out of dental offices because I was a terrible patient. So my goal is kind of to change that dynamic, to change that perception of the dental office and in the dental world and get people from point A to point B where they can get the care that they need. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out and just let me know. And I think that is it. Thank you very much for the time and let me know. Thanks. Okay. Here we are.